Hey, it's great to back be here on Markets Mindset. Got uh, with me Mosh Tomquits, as I always do, Mosh. Welcome back. And for the first time, we have a guest. Joining us today is Colby Griffith, head of uh, U.S. Syndicate, IG Syndicate here at Mizuho. And because he's our guest, we're going to let him go first today. So everybody always wants to know where we're going from where we are, right? Where, what's, what's the future going to hold for us? And to do that, I want to at least stamp people to where we are today. So Colby, a couple of things. Your desk back a couple of months did a survey with investors, about 200 investors. And there were a lot of things that came out of that survey, but three things I thought that were most important or, or things to focus on were one, they all thought spreads would be wider by the end of June. Two, they thought rates would be much lower by the end of June. And of the things that concern them the most, take out the geopolitical risk for a second. One of the things on their radar was the magnitude and pace of Fed easings. We're now halfway through to that June date, and we have completely the opposite of what everybody expected in that survey. And we have a Fed that when we came in, there were calls for predicting a five, six, even seven easings at one point. Now we're down to maybe it's a couple, maybe there's none at all. Maybe Steve Rusciuto's view is completely right. And we've, we're have we not where the Fed wants to be when it comes to easing. So with deals still almost four times oversubscribed and some days five times, deals you know like a French utility that not a lot of people know getting $19 billion in demand, an energy deal today over $30 billion. Why are fixed income investors still there? Why are they hanging on so tightly and so interested in continuing to buy credit at these tighter spreads. You know, investors pretty much went 0 for 3 as far as their, their views coming into the year. Um, you know, I think the biggest, the biggest story here is, is yield. You know, if you look at the IG index, and I know everyone focuses mostly just on spread, but the reality is, is that the majority of the market, upwards of 70 to 80% of the market, actually look at it from a yield perspective. And so if you look at the IG index on, on a yield standpoint, we're actually well above where we started the year. We came into the year with the index hovering around 5%. We've steadily moved higher. We're now sitting right around a 545. And I think that's enabled the market to consistently digest um, and take on the supply that, that we've seen. I think the other factor that, that it certainly goes hand in hand with the, the rate story um, is not just where it is from a level perspective, but also the rate volatility that we've seen, or I should say the lack thereof. If you look at you know, the, the move index, um, it's below the 50, 100 day and, and 200 day moving averages. Um, and below what most of what we saw all of last year and the majority of what we saw during 2022 as well. Um, what has that done? I think that's, that's increased the amount of inflows that we've seen so far in our market. Regardless of which, you know, source you use, whether it's EPFR or, or Lipper, uh, we're running about 2x of where we were at this point last year. And I think that's enabled uh, the market, again, to digest the supply that, that we've seen, even though it's been on a, a record-setting pace. Now, speaking of that record-setting pace, going to turn to you, Mosh. What's going on in the issuer's head right now? We've had this epic issuance so far through the first three and a half months. Where are we right now? Where do you think issuers are right now in their issuance plans? And, and talk about what the rest of the year you think is going to look like from that side, from the supply side. Q1 ended up with $540 billion of issuance when you factor in the oversubscription and rate we're looking at $2 trillion of demand. So because the market's so good, that starts to feed into the psychology of borrowers who are looking at something later in the year, and they look to accelerate that. On top of that, you have the street crying wolf about geopolitical volatility, especially the election. So you put that on top of the overall positive backdrop. That's another reason to go. And I think first and foremost, I think is issuers are starting to embrace the message that Steve Rusciuto has been sending for the last six months, which is higher for longer. And they're looking at their cost of commercial paper, assuming one cut, no cuts, two cuts, and see how that compares to term funding costs. And they're making that decision to go out the curve. So what about later in the year? So what are we going to see for the rest of the year? I know your group has done some work around election volatility. Looked back at the last two elections and found, well, I mean, tell us what you found, but we found that the, the volatility was really compartmentalized right around the election, right before and right after. Yeah, it was interesting because we look back at uh, 2016 and 2020, both arguably very polarizing elections, and the vol spike just happened within kind of one or two week window of the election. And actually, after the election was done, even in 2020, right, when we had all the aftermath off of that, there was such a relief trade going on to the market in terms of broader risk especially in credit, because everyone pre-funds ahead of these elections. So bar investors are looking at the market and saying, okay, there's a relief rally taking place. 
How do I get engaged on it? There is no supply. So we start bidding up secondary and then we start throwing new issues into the market. And do you think you'll see an uptick late in the year? Because we are in a, a year that's got, and we've mentioned this before, pretty heavy maturities this year, but even more for 2025 right now. And that's not including callable paper in the bank sector that could end up coming out as well. You think people will get ahead on that? You're going to see people get ahead of it also because of curve shape, which means carry costs are, are going to be minimal. But I think the other thing that's going to factor into the mix is corporates are just chomping at the bit to do M&A. Good advice. I mean, I talk to you guys all day about this stuff, but I always find something new every time we sit down. So thank you both for being here and uh, we'll see you next time, especially you, Colby, bringing you back. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.